All right, so I think we'll get started. Welcome to SVR 12, whatever that means. What it really is is building your administration, your admin graphical user interfaces over PowerShell. However many of you have actually used PowerShell before. Oh, thank heavens. You know how much better that was in the last session? <laughs> I think I had like four. I was going, oh, I am in trouble. All right, good. And how many of you have ever written a GUI before in your life? This is perfect. All right. So when we're done with the first 30 minutes, you can tell us what we should have said. And then we'll have an improved talk for the next people who don't know as much as you. No, this should be good. Um, so uh, we'll go through a little bit of PowerShell code. We'll actually show a couple of CSV files and XML and, uh, and Excel. And then we'll actually walk through a fair bit of uh, C Sharp code uh, in terms of how we actually, actually uh, implemented it. We'll take a single app and sort of try to build it up a little bit in terms of dealing with delegated administration and making sure that the right task gets, gets assigned to the right person. And you can even do it at the right time, although we don't actually demonstrate that. So just to tee it up for a bit, I'll spend a couple of slides trying to sort of uh, set up the overall context, and Nana will probably walk through uh, code for most of the session. So this is sort of my, actually came from the exchange team as they were beginning to roll out uh, Exchange 14 into the uh, cloud space from simply being an enterprise-focused app to being a cloud-oriented app. They sat down and began to say, oh my gosh, we have users at a various different, uh, across a very wide range. We have external users, more end users, so to speak, and they just want to click and run things. They want it very simple, should be flexible and easy. Um, on the right-hand side, we end up with uh, the engineering support coming out of you know, Exchange itself for internal operations hosters. These guys are IT professionals. They spend all their life in it. And so the frequency of their use of the technology is, of course, radically different. Their expectations of technology are radically different. And yet, across this entire span of users, you need to be able to administer the same sets of systems and sometimes perform very similar actions depending upon the information you have or don't have. So, We'll talk a little bit about how we try to help that happen. The net that I want to sort of take away is, is uh, conceptually, and that's why you're here, because we presume you sort of agree with this, but conceptually the right way to do this is to create targeted or your custom automation, the stuff that you need for your customers to create, so we'll call it targeted automation that tries to span the different islands of technology. In the past, before we had PowerShell or commands, everybody sort of did their own thing, and now we're trying to make it more regular, and we try to take advantage of that. Um, but, but with automation now and with PowerShell, you have the opportunity to sort of bring different worlds together, um, different ways of doing things. And we do that both from a technology standpoint in terms of the data types we access, whether we use the same similar access between file system registry, we use the same similar access between ADO, XML, CSV, all these different file, all these different sort of data formats and actually different program models between COM and .NET. You can access it all from PowerShell. That's on purpose. That's partly why it's loosely coupled, so it becomes easy to deal with the different sets from a, from a single spot. So take advantage of that when you're constructing your automation. Um, make sure you're spanning the technologies to get what the customers need. And then it turns out that you need both GUI and command line. Some of your customers are going to need to perform further automation. That's probably down here more on this spectrum of the engineering support and others are really going to want to have a very simple UI they can click through. And I just got to tell you this story because it, it, some people believe that, um, that end users will never type and they only click. And there's some truth to that. There's also some falsehood to that, right? Um, and so I'll just give you that example. I think it's been long ago I can speak to it. A billion years ago, uh, when I was a child, uh, uh, Jim Alchin sent out an email to all the Microsoft employees because XP had some security uh, problem going on. And he wanted us all to uh, talk to our friends and family and get them to change their XP systems to remove this vulnerability, right? And I was down with that, okay, I can do that. And the problem was that the GUI, all he had was GUI, the GUI instructions he sent out were about five pages long. <laughs> Click here, go there, select this, move here, do this. And if I, I looked at that and I thought, oh my heavens, my mother-in-law is going to kill me if I give her that, and she'll never get it right, and I'll be in the system for forever. And I thought to myself at the time, it would be so much nicer if I could package up something for her to type <laughs> and say, do it, and it would solve the problem for her. 
So having made that observation, and general GUIs are good for discoverability and simplification, but make sure that you're providing the right abstractions, whether it's a command line or a GUI, right? In any case, the number of steps involved that the end user does, the more steps that are manual, the more likelihood of error and problems. There you are. So um, next one. PowerShell tries to make it a little easier to do this because from the very beginning, seven or eight years ago when we first started this, we really did try to say, OK, we really want to live in both worlds at once. And so we put some effort into making sure excuse me, that we could eventually layer GUIs over command line easily. We do that by having a consistent set of commands, which helps you enormously. You can take advantage of that. You can make some assumptions about it. Uh, we have a standard set of verbs. You know what the, you know, a set is likely to do, a set of stop is likely to do, a stop. You can make some assumptions in the UI. Um, we have an adaptive type system, very important here about we, it tells you which are the properties most likely the user would be interested in. If you don't like that, you can go in and change it. For example, we did in the process object, as we did our get process, uh, if you take a look at what comes out of a process info object, well, they didn't have the company. It turns out it's bedded somewhere deep in the bowels of the process object. You have to go three or four levels down. We actually created a specific custom property, sucked that out. That same kind of thing, that same system, the adaptive type system or extended type system is open to every individual that runs PowerShell. It's not something that we had to do specifically. You could have done it. We just did it for everybody by default. So you have the opportunity to actually add customizations and the right abstractions on a per object basis, not just at the script level. Additionally, I've already talked about, we access different data stores in a very similar way. Excuse me. Um, you have the notion of doing a script commandlet. Again, that's about layering on top. Uh, has, how many of you have actually written a script commandlet before an advanced function? You have a fair number. That's essentially a commandlet written in PowerShell. You can write them in C Sharp or PowerShell. In this version, we don't care on purpose. We're pretty explicit about that. We tried to make sure it was a full and robust commandlet, just as strong as you could get from C Sharp. So that allows you to, to again, to abstract without necessarily having to delve into too much code. We have what are called customized run spaces. I'll speak to that for just two seconds. Essentially, a run space is where you actually execute PowerShell commands. You're able to customize them so they only export or make public a certain set of commands. Those, um, get rid of my glasses there. The same, um, whereas internal to that run space, if you have your own automation script inside, you're able to access a host of more private commands. So it gives you kind of the ability, it's not a perfect analogy, but it's kind of similar to a runtime version of a C-sharp class where you have private and public, in this case, except you do it actually at a command level or a PowerShell instance level, public, private. And you're able to get at these things remotely and easily. So we have built-in remoting. A number of people have taken advantage of that. They've sort of been surprised. They write a command. They think, OK, how do I deal with remoting now? And the answer is, you don't. It's OK. We took care of it for you. We have a very common remoting infrastructure already in place. You write the command. We light it up. That's kind of the general approach. Um, and and we'll, we'll show you a little more about the API. We certainly have uh, taken pains in version 2 and the Windows 7 to move that further along to try to make sure that the API makes it easier to write uh, GUIs on top of. And we'll, we'll try to show you uh, some of that as we move forward. All right, some principles involved in actually layering uh, GUIs over PowerShell. This just comes from, uh, from some experience that we and others have had. Uh, the first great benefit here is, is make sure you've, again, separated the business from the presentation logic. In theory, you've encapsulated all your business logic in your scripts, your commands, your advanced functions, whatever you want to call them. You've got that encapsulated. None of it's in your UI. SCVMM, a system center virtual machine manager, layered 100% of their UI over PowerShell in the last version, shipping. And sometime in their last milestone, they went through some review. I forget what the prompting was but in fact needed to completely reskin their UI, they came back and were just euphoric with us because in fact they'd layered over PowerShell and their first UI had taken like 10 months and the second reskinning took about two weeks. And so they found an order of magnitude or more benefit by in fact keeping these two separate. Now you can keep them separate of course in theory, but it turns out if you really enforce the PowerShell layer, then it moves theory into practice a lot easier, right? And by the way, this enables better testing. 
right? Your test infrastructure never has to change. You can test all the key stuff once, and you don't care which UI it is. It also enables third parties to take advantage of the same business logic and create custom UIs for you. So if you don't get the UI perfect, it's OK. Somebody else can construct their own a little easier, right? So you're not quite as uh, locked into it. Large surface area doesn't mean you have to expose everything. This is sort of a, a key principle to keep in mind. Uh, some customers really shouldn't see some functions. That's OK to prevent them from seeing it. Um, and I think Exchange, and I've noticed this example, used this example before, noted to us um, that when they were doing their UI over PowerShell, there was some stuff that used to complicate their administration UI before that they simply didn't put in there anymore because they could all simply say, just go to PowerShell. We're going to keep that complex thing, which would screw up the simple, the simple UI. Let's not screw up the simple UI. Let's keep the complex stuff down in PowerShell or write a little command to abstract it, and we'll keep the UI a little more pristine. So take advantage of that opportunity to simplify your UI. Um, and then this one I always thought was kind of interesting. It says, don't expect users to ever figure it out. And that was their words. It wasn't mine. I thought that was probably good, because as a user, there are times when I wonder if I will ever figure some of these UIs out. And so I'm grateful when the UI deals with my errors robustly in a way that's meaningful. So assume people are always going to create errors. You know that just from code in general. Just thought we pointed out particularly here. Um, I'll go through a brief overview of the management stack, and uh, Don will actually tell you what it really means. Um, so this is layered on top. This is the uh, various UIs. And we layer it over the PowerShell client runtime, which means at the client side, we actually do this. And you'll see on the right-hand side a number of actual uh, interactive command lines. That's OK. We use exactly the same underlying technology. Um, and then the dotted line in between is the uh, remoting space. That's where we go uh, between machines. You can, of course, do it on the same machine. You can pretend all your machines are remote if you want to. And then we have the um, WinRM plugin, which allows you to deal with remoting according to the WSMAN uh, standards. Authentication, we use Windows Auth in our uh, particular uh, uh, example here. The, um, the, the white things with the lines on the side are actually sort of an indication of what we chose to do in terms of implementation-wise with our demo. You might make other choices. So we used a WPF application. It could have been a Silverlight application. You know, maybe in time we'll do one of those demos. That would be kind of fun. We use basic Windows authorization. We have three or four different authorization schemes we could have used. Um, in this case, authorization is interesting. We actually use CSV files extensively throughout to just define the roles and see how much UI I can get for almost free just by changing CSV files once I have the right infrastructure in place. And with that, we're going to start with a very um, simple UI, kind of like brain damage simple. We're just going to do like the equivalent of a get. <laughs> um, just to sort of show the basic constructs of layering uh, any UI over PowerShell. And then we'll flow from there to something a little more advanced, talk, talking about uh, handling, remoting, uh, run space pools, custom actions, um, that kind of thing, so you can get a sense as to what it starts to look like. And then for the final demo, we'll flow into delegated administration, uh, where we start to talk about um, making sure that the right user gets the right action at the right time. This is really an important concept. I'd spend just uh, another minute on this one. Um, you know, I, all right, I used this example last time. So if anyone was in the last session, I'm sorry. <laughs> but it's the one that keeps coming to my mind. Because Friday, I took my daughter to get her wisdom teeth out. And I had complete confidence in the orthodontist that she would come back with the wisdom teeth removed and nothing you know, in there that shouldn't be. Well, Monday, I took my car in to get its tranny rebuilt. I would not have wanted that guy working on my daughter's teeth. right? They're just totally different people. That's delegation, right? You go get this done. It's you. You have your set of tools. I wouldn't have wanted her to have the, the tranny guy working on her mouth. I don't want her orthodontist to be working on my transmission because it, it's got to get fixed. So the same thing exists in IT world. It's just a little less extreme. Um, but different people have different needs, different abilities. You have to make sure you target the right thing. So last demo, we'll talk a little more about how we actually do that with delegated administration. So let's look at you know, how do we build a very simple GUI on top of PowerShell. 
So before we begin, so I'm going to do a get command dash noun process. So as this suggests, PowerShell uses what we call a standard verb noun syntax uh, you know, for every command. So what that means is if you want to get a process object, I do get process. If you want to start, I do start process. You know, for start, stop, it's stop process. And if I want to do the same, let's say on a service object, then it's going to be you know, a get for a get service, right? Stop service, start service, so on and so forth. So there is this consistent um, you know, verb noun pattern that PowerShell uses. Now, I'm going to build, the intention here is we're going to build a very simple GUI, you know, which is going to get a list of objects, and it's going to display in a list view. Now, the, the objects can be anything, right? So if I want to do a, a process object, then I know I want to do a get process. If I have to do, let's say, uh, a service object, I know I have to do a get service. So what we did was we defined uh, a CSV file where I specify what is the noun that I want to operate on, and I also, you know, if there is any optional initialization script, which means, like, for example, get process is something that's shipping by default in PowerShell, so I don't have any script. Uh, but I can write my own, for example, get inventory, right, which is going to, you know, get me inventory objects of, uh, you know, different systems. And I could have defined that particular command as, can I mention it's a script commandlet, so I could have defined it in a script. So in this case, it will specify, you know, where that particular command or in which script that particular command resides. So I'm going to now use this particular CSV file to actually drive my UI. So let me first run it. And as you see here, now I get a list of process objects. And what I have done is, here's a, a list view that displays what are the default display property set. Now, this is another feature that's available in uh, PowerShell. So PowerShell has a very flexible adaptive type system. And one of the features that's available in the type system is what's called a default display property set, right? As the name suggests, it's the default display, right? So the process object has you know, so many different properties. Now, if I'm doing it on a command line, or you know, if I'm doing list view like this, what are the set of properties that you know, I want to pick and choose to display by default? So here, what I'm doing is I'm querying you know, for a process object what is going to be the default display property set, and I'm you know, associating each of the properties with a particular column in the list view. And how we did that, you know, we could just go through the code. Now, as I said, because I'm using, um, uh, for example, I mean, because I'm using the CSV file, I can easily change now the noun that I'm going to use. Now, let's say I change process to service. So I get a list of, oops, sorry, I forgot to change, I mean, I forgot to save, so. It's a list of service objects. Or I can completely define something else. So I'm going to use a script command that I have. And I want to get a list of organization proxies. So I specify that as the noun. Make sure I save it so that we don't run into the same problem. Yeah. There you go. So irrespective of whatever is the you know, underlying object, we use two of the paradigms used in PowerShell. One is we use the standard verb noun uh, uh, you know, syntax to, to get. So I say get whatever is the noun. And I'm also using uh, the default display property set to display. So now let me walk you through the code on what we're doing. So I'm just creating a helper object. And the interesting piece is here, get command for noun. So what I'm going to, sorry, execute command for noun. So specifying you know, for the given noun, I'm going to uh, get the results, and also the default display property set. So get into this function, and here's the key part. So I construct the command using the verb noun syntax, and this is a small script commandlet that I wrote to actually you know, query and figure out what is the default display property set. And I'm layering actually a GUI on top of a script. And then I execute get tasks. So let's look at what this function looks like. So here's what it is. So I have created a run space, which as I said is a space within which you run you know, PowerShell commands. And it, uh, the ad advantage of using a run space is you know, when you run multiple commands, it carries over the state from one command to the next. For example, you can assign a variable, say $A equal to 10, 
let's say, in, in, in one command, and you executed another command and you want to access the value of $A, then you know, it, it is propagated through the run space. So you create a run space and assign it to a PowerShell that I create in this step. So it's that simple. You know, I say uh, PowerShell.create. And if you want to just add a command, like for example, in this case, get process, I just say PowerShell.add command. Now, if you want to say specify a property, you know, get process dash name uh, notepad, right? So you do dot add command, get process, dot add parameter, name of the parameter, and its value. Or sometimes you might want to specify an argument, like you know, without specifying a dash name, you might want to just say get process um, notepad, in which case you do add command, add argument. So it's, it's pretty easy, like you know, what you type on the command line, you can actually translate it very easily into an API. And you know, what you type in an API, you can convert it back into script. You know, we can, in the next demo, I'll actually be showing how we translate what we construct as command into the equivalent script text. Now, if any of you had actually you know, uh, programmed a GUI using PowerShell v1 APIs, you would actually realize that this is a lot simpler than what we initially had in v1. Like, I can see some heads nodding. It's, it's definitely a lot simpler. And there was a lot of feedback and a lot of work that went into making it this simple. So once I construct the PowerShell, all we do is PowerShell invoke. And it returns a collection of PS object. Now, PS object is the output type that PowerShell um, you know, de uh, defines. And PS object makes data binding very, very easy. And we will see that in a bit. So now I have executed my you know, get task. And I get the results. I execute another, another get task from which I you know, get the default display property set. And I'm going to return back to my UI window. You know, this is where I'm actually doing. So I'm, I'm, I'm getting the output objects. I'm getting the default display property set. And I'm constructing a grid view with the set of properties. So what I'm doing here is you know, for every property, I'm, I'm constructing a column. And I'm assigning data binding saying, OK, for this property, you know, assign uh, uh, to, to that particular column. And here's the inter interesting part. To the source, I actually specify a collection of PS objects. Now, the underlying object can be a process object, or a service object, or an inventory object. But all of them are wrapped in a PS object. And whenever you query for a property of the underlying object, PS object automatically returns. And therefore, it makes data binding pretty simple. Like, you don't have to you know, do any typecasting. You can directly take a collection of PS objects and assign it. And it automatically does, uh, you know, it has uh, the mechanism built in to do data binding. So with that, switch back the slides. So what did we leverage here, right? We leveraged the consistent uh, command uh, discovery mechanism, which is the verb noun syntax. We also use script commandlets. As I specified, I used the get default display property set. You know, that's a script command that I wrote to actually figure out what is available. Uh, by the way, it is pretty easy for you to actually define this set uh, in the types.ps1 XML file. So you know, for any object, you know, if it's not available, you can just uh, write a types.ps1 XML file, specify the default display property set, and you can say, you know, like update type data and specify that file, and it's taken care of. Um, and that's all. Um, we saw the simple you know, PowerShell hosting APIs and it, you know, how easy it is to do data binding with these APIs. So the next one demo that we are going to talk about is you know, building remote UI. So this is the basic building block. You know, it's, it's very easy. Now, when we're on a transition between you know, locally hosting, which is like you know, I, I just uh, invoked a PowerShell command on this particular machine, uh, to invoking a PowerShell command on a remote machine, the only difference is how you construct the run space. Uh, everything else is going to be the same. In fact, literally the same piece of code, you know, depending on you know, how we create the run space. Uh, and the run space parent object is, in fact, it's the same base object. So once you create a run space and assign, then it's completely you know, transparent, how, whether you're operating locally or remotely. You know. So in this other demo, we are uh, doing a, a bunch of things. And I'll walk through one at a time. 
So basically on the same machine, I have a bunch of endpoints defined. Now an endpoint is by default, PowerShell has an endpoint called Microsoft.PowerShell, which is defined, which loads the default PowerShell. But it is possible for you to you know, um, define another endpoint which, you know, with different capabilities. For example, I can do this. So I say the endpoint is called as a session configuration because you know, uh, PowerShell connections on the command line, we call them as sessions. So this is called a session configuration. I give it a name, say demo, and I can specify a startup script. So I'm going to use the startup script that is available here. Yes to all. And what this has done is this has defined an endpoint uh, by name demo. So I can say new session, or when I create from my code, I can specify the endpoint. So as you see here, these are the different endpoints available. So I have a demo.inventory, demo.service, and a demo.employee already created. So I can specify endpoint. And what is interesting is I have specified a startup script to run along with the endpoint. So you can either do it through startup script or through c -sharp code, but startup scripts are a lot simpler. And what we do here is the, as soon as PowerShell you know, uh, launches the remote connection, it will first run the script. So you can do multiple things. For example, if you're connecting to uh, your Exchange server, and you know, right at the time you want, you, know, you make the connection, you want all the Exchange commandlets available, then you know, you'll specify in the startup script to actually load the Exchange commandlets. Right? Or in other words, if, you, if I'm doing delegation, I don't want somebody to mess around with my system, then I'll, in this specific particular uh, startup script, I'm going to constrain my system, you know, making sure that they don't have access to the whole machine, but only a certain set of commandlets. So what are, whether you want to expand or you want to you know, constrain, you do it in this particular startup script. So now that I have those defined, I'm going to connect to a uh, demo.service as a particular user. And I haven't, you know, because this is demo code and I'm, this will be going public on our uh, blog site so people can download and play with it, I have tried to keep the UI as minimum as possible. So fancy things like, you know, doing things in the background and upgrading UI. None of that is available in this demo. That's why you find that the UI is freezing a bit, and then it's going to come up with a bunch of results. So this is more to explain uh, you know, how you can use PowerShell. At the same time, PowerShell also supports asynchronous invocation. And as I said, the power, I mentioned this in the previous talk, PowerShell IAC is completely built using these APIs. So this is the PowerShell integrated scripting environment, and this is completely built on the public APIs that's available to anyone. So here you see, um, so this is the basic UI layout. So uh, I have two list views. And using the principles that I said in the EC GUI, I have actually populated to these two list views. And now, depending on the context, uh, the information in this pane is going to keep changing. So to do that, what I'm using is I use a control map.csv that specifies, OK, for a given role, you know, a user, for example, the user that I logged in is an admin role. So what's going to be there in control one for the user, and what's going to be there in control two? So using that, I can specify, you know, it can be employees, or it can be processes, or services, inventory, so on and so forth. And then here, I have constructed a list of actions. Now for that, in the constraining endpoint, I have a commands.csv file that specifies for a given role, what are the commands that are available? So you pick these commands, and I have constructed the different actions here. And now, to look into the code on how this is done, so first let's look at how do we construct the endpoint, right? So if you look at it, I'm constructing a WSMAN connection info object. Now, PowerShell remoting uses WinRM for transport. So all I'm specifying here is I'm creating a connection info object that tells me what are the parameters that I need to pass to WinRM. So I'm specifying what is the connection URI, you know, which is something on this particular local box for this demo. And I'm also specifying you know, what is the endpoint configuration, whether you want to connect to the inventory endpoint or whether you want to connect to the service endpoint, plus what are going to be the user credentials. Based on this, you know, a different uh, startup script will be run, and you know, a different set of operations will be performed at the remote end. The other notion that I'm using here is what's called the notion of run space pools. Now, a run space maintains a state, and to execute anything on PowerShell, you, know, you need a run space. 
If you don't specify one, PowerShell is going to use the default run space. Now, typically what happens in UI like this is like, you have um, multiple commands you know, or multiple UI elements, and you want to run multiple commands. Like, for example, if you look at it, what I currently perform, there are two commands that I had to run. Now, doing one by one is, of course, you know, it's going to serialize. You're not, you're not getting a lot of parallelism. So we give you this concept of run space pools wherein you can specify, OK, I need a maximum of, say, you know, five run spaces. And you know, depending on the availability, you know, whenever a run space is free, you can, it'll automatically execute a PowerShell command in that particular run space. And if, if enough a run space is not available, then it's going to automatically do queuing. So that's the parallelism at the GUI layer. So for the demo purpose, I'm just creating a run space uh, pool of 1, 1. So this info parameter will be missing in the local case. So that's the only difference. So I create a run space factory dot create run space pool. I do 1, 1 or 1, 5. It's local. I do 1, 5, you know, pass an info. It's remote. And then I open it, assign it to a PowerShell. The rest of the code is exactly the same. Nothing changes. So it's that simple you know, transitioning from a, a local uh, session-based GUI to a remote one. So once I create that, I'm going to you know, initialize, open, and initialize action. I'm just like you know, opening the connection, and I'm going to load it here. So here we have a few things. The first is I'm getting, um, before we get to the refresh control, I'll just talk about what I'm doing here, which is the get tasks. So get task is, again, um, a, a script command that I had written at the endpoint, if you actually look at it. So it's defined in the employee commands or you know, whatever is the endpoint uh, startup script. And that gives you uh, the list of default commands that are available for, uh, for the particular user who is logged in. And what we are doing is I'm constructing you know, a, a button element for each of the uh, you know, actions. So here's, here's the commands.csv file. So you hit us the different commands available, and you take that, and you construct the action. And because PowerShell uses a, a standard uh, verb noun syntax, from uh, the action, I can actually figure out you know, what I need to do. So I go to the handler, and based on the verb and noun, and based on the context, I can actually take standard actions. OK, once I do that, what this refresh control 1 does is basically you know, using the same principle. It you know, refreshes, this is what I call control 1. It refreshes this pane using the same principles. This is control 2. It refreshes, again, this pane based on the same principles on what's selected in this end. Now, what's interesting about this is because we have layered everything using CSV files and startup scripts and, and you know, different endpoints are configured, now I can run the same command or the same application. I can connect to an employee endpoint. Uh, and we actually see you know, it's, it's a completely different UI. So what has changed is just things on the back end. And everything is, is the same here. Switching back. So um, what did we leverage here? We leveraged the built-in remoting capabilities of PowerShell so that you, know, you can connect to different endpoints, which can be on the same machine, on different machines. And we actually you know, go through uh, uh, you know, commands on the other machine. We also used uh, the, the CSV files and custom properties that are available uh, as part of the extended type system. Uh, status execution, and run oh, that's another important aspect of run space pool. Now, because you know, if, when you execute against a run space pool, it can execute on any one of the free run spaces available. There's no guarantee that you know, the state is going to be uh, carried forward between one command to the next. So typically, when you use run space pool, it's, it's more for asynchronous invocation when you don't need to depend on the state. And one thing which I missed, which I can always switch back and show, is how to do a script display. So refresh control. So actually, if you look at it here, in execute command for control, I do two things. So I do a get command, get noun, and I do a get default display property set. However, unlike the previous case, what I'm doing is I'm creating two PowerShells. You can see here PowerShell get PowerShell, 
and I'm also doing another PowerShell down here, and I'm assigning the same run space pool to both of these PowerShells. And now I can do an asynchronous invocation and you know, wait for both the commands. So you know, simultaneously on the same run space pool inside you know, in two different run spaces, uh, you know, it, the commands are going to get executed. Now in this case, I did a one comma one. Therefore, what's going to happen is the run space pool is going to automatically queue until the existing run space gets free, and it's going to continue. So the queuing mechanism is built in. And now, as I said, you know, it's pretty easy to uh, take what's existing in a script and convert it into a you know, PowerShell command, PowerShell.add command, .ar .ar argument. So the other way also holds good. So what we do here is, as we add commands, you now as I do a PowerShell.add argument, I just do maintain a string, you know, plus, and you know, if I do an add parameter, then I know on the command line it means dash parameter name space value. So I construct a string and raise an event, which is then captured and displayed here as the script executed. So this is something that we strongly encourage, uh, you know people implementing GUI on top of PowerShell to actually do, because then it gives the user, okay, here's the script that I actually need to run, and the user can then you know, just copy paste that and you know, edit, modify, and you know, it's, it's automation in, in a simple step. So that's about how we use the PowerShell APIs to do a script display. So the third demo is here we're gonna talk about how we're gonna do delegation and customized DUI. Now, as I said, people who had been here on the previous talk, they know the importance of delegation, right? So let's say there are two people in my organization, you know, Sorin, who is uh, you know, an administrator, and uh, Shiva, who is a manager. Therefore, you know, like Sorin administers machines, but Shiva just wants to know what are the status on each of the machines in his data center, right? So when, when Sorin connects to an endpoint that deals with services, he has the option to you know, get a service, start, stop, and he has the option to manage multiple services. Whereas when Shiva does that, he has restricted access. And the way we're going to do that so I specified a startup script, right? I did a register PS session sometime back, and I specified a startup script. So inside, inside the startup script, you know, I am. I have a couple of CSV files, one that specifies what are the users available, what's their role, um, one that specifies what are the commands and what are the UI control mappings, and I do a bunch of imports. And this is the script that contains my custom script commands. But towards the very end, these are going to be the interesting pieces. Now, the execution context.session state. So session state contains whatever is available within PowerShell. It can be variables, functions, you know, the native applications, scripts, everything. Right? So, and here I specify you know, session state.applications.clear. So what that means is remove the ability to run any native command. So you know, commands like format or notepad, none of them is going to be available in this particular session. We're also going to you know, remove all the scripts, or you can add scripts. So I can you know, create a getInventory.ps1 and say the user has only the permissions or the ability to run that particular script. And here's the interesting part, which is get command. I get all the command alias and function, and whichever is not there in the list that I constructed above, I'm going to set them to set their visibility to private. Now, what this means is, you know, a user in this case, let's say Soren, is going to connect to the endpoint. Now, he will not be able to see or you know access these uh, commandlets and uh, functions. However, you know, I can have a function which I'm going to expose to him. Let's say, you know, uh, get inventory, and within those functions. I'll be able to use them. So they are you know, private in the, in, in the very sense of programming. So they are available only for commands that are within uh, the scope of this uh, startup script. And you can also specify what's going to be the language mode. Now, PowerShell supports three language modes. We have the no language, and we have the restricted language, and full language. Now, full language is, uh, is the default, where you have all the language capabilities. Um, and suppose you know, a user connects and he's going to run an infinite loop depriving the endpoint uh, system of resources. That's bad. So you can always set uh, you know, the uh, language mode to no language where none of the language elements are available. Or you can also set to restricted language where a restricted set like you know, what's the UI culture, what's the uh, you know, culture, and, and certain things are available. So once we do this, you know, this script is run. And you know, when you connect to the endpoint, because the script is run, there's a constrained environment that's available. So now, 
I'm gonna. What's this? I'm running the same promoting UI. I'm connecting to the service endpoint, and I'm connecting as Sorin now. Let's wait for a while while uh, this uh, thing comes up. Let me just close in the meanwhile the previous UI. So now, if you actually look at it here, you know, Sorin is connecting to different machines. You know, the application server, mail server, and the database server, and he's querying for the services. If you actually look at it, when I initially made the connection, the connection was made to an endpoint on this machine, but how are we able to query uh, you know, service status on a different machine? You know, maybe Sorin is an administrator. So let's actually go and take a look. So I have my list of users. I don't find Sorin here. So what we actually did is, I have a user here called a delegate user, and I have an impersonation. So I have a command return in service for impersonation called get delegation credential. And what that does is get delegation credential gets the credential you know, for delegation to a particular computer, and it connects. And this de get delegation credential is actually not available. It's not public. Uh, if you look at the list of commands for service, let's open up for service. So get delegation credential is not public. It's in the private scope. And therefore, you know, that command is not available to Sorin, but I'm actually able to effectively delegate from one machine to another. So there's another layer of abstraction you know, making this delegation possible. So you, know, you can impersonate, you, know, you can ACL, and you, know, you can do a lot of interesting things. So now I'm going to connect to the same endpoint, but as a different user. And by the way, this is based on uh, top of PowerShell. So none of these capabilities you know, is lost in, in the command line. So even if the user were to connect to the endpoint using uh, the command line, they are going to exactly have the same set of capabilities, which means if you can see services, then Shiva can, you know, if he connects to the command line, he would only be able to you know, get, have access to get service. And he's not going to have access to you know, start service or stop service, so on and so forth. So that's it with the demos. Switch back. All right, so I just want to <clears throat> highlight a couple of points here uh, just before we sort of uh, move on. And that's sort of, sort of here's, here's how you end up implementing delegated administration. Um, the first step is to create an endpoint. So that's it. And then you register it with a name and an ACL so that person X has permission to access that endpoint, person Y doesn't. At that endpoint, you can constrain anything they can see about the system so it can act as a screening boundary. All they can do is access that endpoint and nothing else. And then you can impersonate to a different user, it doesn't necessarily have to be elevated, but to a different user within your code and actually move forward. The startup script is the place where you constrain what that individual access in your machine can do we would highly recommend if you wanted to access a security boundary, one, that would be remote, and two, that in fact you use the no language mode because then all they can do is invoke commands. They can't do anything else and create any sort of denial of service problems. But again, you can still register an endpoint with the name, the ACL, a startup script, and then the startup script can configure you know, which commands in the language mode. You delegate by registering different endpoints with different capabilities, and then you script them depending upon the incoming request. Let's go sort of hit the highlights then just to make sure. So we think as we move forward in PowerShell V2 or Windows 7, uh, you do have the opportunity to take advantage of it and to begin, we begin to enable GUI over command line, trying to bring those two worlds together. If we take a look at Soren and logged in as him and done a get command, you'd have just seen they wouldn't be able to start or stop a service, they'd just be able to get a service. Same thing with custom apps or not. 
the adaptive type system, and of course the built-in remoting for free. I won't go through that list. It's the same one as we showed earlier. It hasn't changed any. Uh, using this, hopefully you'll be able to address your broad set of customer needs. Not necessarily 100%. We haven't done all the work. We've just tried to enable you to do the work of reaching broadly across all of your users. But at least it's a first step. Before, you had to do a lot more work, our job as well as yours. Now we're trying to at least stand up to our job, let you do yours. And that's really it. We have a few more minutes for uh, questions and Q&A if people have a set of questions. Let's go for that gentleman. And yes. So the first one, is there a best practices guide? A best practices guide in terms of how to layer GUI over PowerShell? Not yet. We're beginning to construct one. <laughs> You've seen its inception. And the second question, I doubt not, could you ask one more time, please? Have we made it easier to do using MMC itself? No, we've not. Right now, we have a tendency to have moved a little more towards a WPF, in fact, of most of our, our applications and demo. That's just the way to think. This gentleman and then, then you, sir. Um, where was the demo code going to be available? Um, it, it's going to be available in the PowerShell blog. So it's, uh, you know, I, I forgot the URL. It's what, blogs.msdn.com slash PowerShell. I, I'll post it. And yeah. Should we will find it? Yeah, you should. People will show that quick. Or yes. The, uh, the execution policies that you have to have in a local and remote system, forget this, the uh, delegation mode, table trick. Uh, the execution mode has, has to be understood for, for the demo. I don't think you made the execution. Did you make the execution unrestricted for the demo? And that would be because normally, um, let me talk about the production one that we would have wanted to have exchanged. And that's our encouragement to them, where they actually went live with all this throughout the whole web, was that we would prefer that it was a no language mode when the user connected, and that everything was kept uh, locally and private. Because explicitly in that case, we didn't want them to deal with denial of service. So you can choose which one it is. And of course, you know, depending upon which one you choose, then you'll have different capabilities. And, but your startup script should allow you to do that. I think there was one back, the man in the tan shirt behind. Yeah? Will there be language support for Power Visual, for, visual, for PowerShell in Visual Studio? Did I get that right? At some point. You know, I can't, I can't make prognostications in, in this meeting. That's certainly you know, a long-term desire to make sure that you could uh, code in PowerShell using Visual Studio. That came up actually the last session. Right now, uh, we have the integrated scripting environment, which you've seen. Um, it, we really want to have PowerShell usable in both the languages and have made some effort in that regard, certainly been working that, that issue. Um, the reason why we did the integrated scripting environment is because we really need to be able to ship on all clients, on all systems. So if an admin goes up to a box, they have something they can edit their script in, right? And I can't really insist that Visual Studio is installed on every PC in the world, although the Visual Studio team would love that. <laughs> the man in blue? Yes, the PS1. So that is the, and we're at PowerShell version 2. That's kind of the implicit question. Why is it PS1 versus PS2? That's the language extension for when we necessarily would want to make a breaking language change. It's not a version number. So we've explicitly tried to tease those two things apart. We've debated a while internally, much more than we probably should have, as to whether we just should have had a .ps, but then there was the whole postscript problem. And anyway, so it was just, we, we ended up with PS1 and and I guess we're going to live with it. Can you create an endpoint on Windows 2003? Uh, yes, you can. So can you create an endpoint on Windows 2003? Yes. So uh, PowerShell 2.0 you know, is, is now part of what we call the Windows Management Framework, which contains PowerShell 2.0, Winarum 2.0, and Bits 4.0. And it's available all the way down to uh, you know, 2K3 and XP. So once you have uh, you know, the Windows Management Framework installed on downloadable systems, uh, yeah, then you can create the endpoints and work against them. Uh, yes, sir. I'm not sure I follow the delegation story here. Did you get uh, delegated credentials that we have the PowerShell script and we would have a password in there? How, how are we protecting the delegated account credentials? 
Okay, so the, the typical way we could uh, do, you know, it's like Windows has something called as uh, a, a, a credential manager where you can actually store credentials and, and you know, you can read off of it. And, you know, for the, for the demo purposes, I use just a script called get delegation credential, but that's just to show that, you know, there are various ways in which you can impersonate. But if you want the, re the actual solution that ships in Windows for you to safely store credentials is the credentials manager. So you go to control ma panel, you'll be able to find that out. That's a fair question. There was, I saw another hand back here. Ah, uh, yes, Tan should again. Yeah, I have a question about the uh, PowerShell ISDs. Mm -hmm. Not yet. How we do, we do have, so the question was whether we have IntelliSense and ISC. Uh, we don't have it right, right now, but there are certain partner, you know, uh, ISCs that are available uh, which actually come with IntelliSense. Yeah. And this is the blog you wanted to show? Oh, yeah, so this is the, the, the site of the PowerShell blog, so blogs.msdn.com slash PowerShell. They already figured that, that people who wanted actually made a note of it, so. Just want to make sure, okay. Other questions? Once, twice. I want to switch back for a second. Sure. We are. Do please fill out the session forms. We care. We'll look at them. Believe me. We'll look at all the comments. We'll look at the scores. We appreciate your being here. Thank you very much. You guys have a great day.